Well, good evening, and may I welcome you most warmly uh, to this very... I will try again, thank you. <laughs> Hopefully it will be better the second time than the first, but time will tell. I, can I say how thrilled I am to be able to welcome you to this most wonderful event uh, this evening, and indeed this uh, beautiful uh, School of Management building. Um, this evening is a really special time for us in many ways. Um, it, the, the evening is co-hosted uh, by the Institute of Policy Research here at the University of Bath. The Institute leads our public policy research and enables us to transfer the knowledge and expertise we have in a whole range of policy areas from net zero to social security, digital manufacturing, to widening participation in higher education, right through to engaging with policy makers, both here in the West of England and in Whitehall and Westminster. The Institute hosts an extensive series of public debates on pressing policies challenges, and we've been delighted as to how those have gone in, in recent years. Um, this evening, however, is special, as I say in a minute, and I'd like to thank, therefore, Professor Nick Pierce and the IPR team, as well as the School of Management uh, Administration, and as well as Don McLaraferty, uh, our lay member of council, and Rajani Naidu, uh, our Vice President of Community Inclusion, for all they've done to make this success event successful so far. The event is also significant in other ways. It's the first in-person event that has been held in by the IPR since the pandemic. Uh, we've had 260 people signed up to attend in person, which is wonderful. And may I therefore not only welcome you, but also welcome the 206 online that have signed up. Uh, so it really does highlight the benefit that's now being gained from the use of hybrid technologies um, for events such as this. So the total signing up has been nearly 500 people. I'm so grateful, therefore, for all the work that's gone into this. And I hope it is a most interesting time for all of you, both in person and online. The numbers of involved, of course, highlight how fortunate we are to have our speaker this evening. And it is for me an enormous personal honour to extend my sincere welcome to Andrew Haldane, who is the Chief Executive of the Royal Society for Arts, having, of course, formerly been Chief Economist at the Bank of England and a member of the Bank's Monetary Policy, and indeed recognised as one of the leading thinkers globally. His extensive publications, honorary professorships, and his leadership of the government's levelling up agenda places him in a unique position to deliver this extremely important lecture tonight on the second great transition. Thank you so much for joining with us. I look forward very much to learning from your insights. I'll now hand over to the chair for tonight, Dr. Matt Dixon, who's a reader in public policy at the IPR, where he leads the program of research and widening participation in higher education. Matt, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Vice Chancellor, and good evening to everybody here joining us in the auditorium and also to everybody joining us online. May I add my welcome to that of the Vice Chancellor? The IPR is delighted uh, to be hosting this event this evening. As the Vice Chancellor has said, is the first hybrid event uh, post pandemic. So we're excited about the possibilities that this brings, combining the benefits of in person discussion and debate uh, with the added accessibility and the reach that the online component provides. The event is being uh, recorded, and a recording will be made available on the IPR website uh, shortly after the event. And so later on, we have questions and answers. Um, if you do have a question here, you will be kind of on the recording. So just to make everybody aware of that. For this first hybrid event, we have a fascinating topic and an excellent speaker. Allow me to formally introduce Andrew Haldane. Andrew is the Chief Executive of the Royal Society of Arts, and he was formerly Chief Economist at the Bank of England. Uh, and as the Vice Chancellor said, a, a member of the Bank's Monetary Policy Committee uh, during what was, we look back on the golden age of macroeconomic stability. 
uh, just a few short months ago. Um, uh, among many other positions, he is Honorary Professor at the Universities of Nottingham and Manchester. He's a visiting professor at King's College London and a visiting fellow at Nuffield College Oxford and a fellow of the Royal Society and the Academy of Social Sciences. He's authored around 200 articles and four books. And Andrew is the founder and president of the charity Pro Bono Economics, vice chair of the charity National Numeracy, co-chair of the City of London Task Force on Social Mobility, and Chair of the National Numeracy Leadership Council. Andrew was the Permanent Secretary for Leveling Up at the Cabinet Office from September 2021 to March this year, and as of June this year, he has been chairing the Leveling Up Advisory Council. So the aim of the event this evening is to hear Andrew's view on the transformative thinking that is needed to enhance life opportunities as the population uh, begins to live longer lives, patterns of education and work change, and uh, to consider the reworking of social institutions and cultural norms that this will inevitably entail. We'll also hear about the work that the RSA is undertaking to embrace this change and this challenge. So Andrew will give his presentation, and then following this, uh, Professor Rajni Naidu from our School of Management here at Bath will respond to Andrew's uh, comments before we have a question and answer session that will be open to uh, both everybody here and our online participants. Online delegates have the opportunity throughout uh, the evening to add questions using the uh, chat function on Zoom, and these questions will magically find their way to me in time for the Q&A. Uh, and if you are here in the auditorium with a question, we have uh, a couple of roving mics which will uh, less magically find their way to you uh, if you've got a question. After the Q&A session, all of you here uh, are invited to stay for a drinks reception in the uh, pavilion. They've not yet invented a way for our online delegate, delegates to partake of the uh, drinks reception, unfortunately, so uh, it will just be the, the people here. But that does give an incentive to be here and join us for events in person if you possibly can. So now, without further ado, may I hand over to our speaker for this evening, Andrew Haldane. Well, thank you, uh, Ian, for that lovely introduction and to Matt for that lovely introduction as well. Evening, everyone. Fantastic to almost see you all, actually. Uh, and to all those online as well, what an amazing um, new auditorium and amazing audience. Um, the last time I gave a public lecture, actually, was a few weeks ago now, up at the University of Glasgow. Uh, halfway through, the Prime Minister resigned. Now, no such plans this evening. Um, but who knows? Um, uh, I thought what I might talk a bit about um, is engaging a bit of futurology. Um, there's no question uh, that we are on the cusp of something big. Um, the Fourth Industrial Revolution, huge implications for our economy, for our society. Uh, one element of that transition is, of course, the climate transition. That's a huge transition as the lights um, are raised. Uh, that's not what we're going to discuss today. It's obviously a huge issue, not least here we are at COP27. I want to talk instead a bit about some of the economic uh, and social transformations that may lie in store looking ahead to the remainder of the 21st century. What might be needed to our social institutions, the world of education, the world of work, to make best uh, of those challenges and opportunities. So more than usually, this will be a set of speculations about what might happen, an act of imagining about where we might be. And that's why I particularly welcome your thoughts, uh, your reflections, your questions, your critiques uh, of just where we might be uh, looking uh, ahead. I should say, this is my first visit, scandalously, Ian, to the university, I apologize. Uh, for that. I feel another place really well because um, I spent, what, 32 years at the Bank of England. Uh, I had a steady stream of fantastic sandwich students from Bath through the bank. So I know how rich this place is, uh, just how rich that placement schemes are uh, to, to such the point where we hired loads of Bath students for just that reason. So I feel like, although I'm new here, 
uh, I'm in a sense uh, coming, coming home. I'm going to do a bit of history to start off. Uh, that's the first great transition, by the way. And then some more speculation, futurology about what the future um, might hold. So let's start with some of the history. Um, looks like I'm doing this. Um, and here's some history um, of the economy. Uh, over a decent spell of time. Uh, so we have here uh, income, GDP per head, there on the left, and the measure of wealth uh, on the right. Quite striking pictures, both of those, I'm sure you agree. Uh, and it's clear from those that something extraordinary happened around the time of the first Industrial Revolution in the 18th, early 19th century. In fact, um, you could stretch that GDP chart way, way back, many millennia, uh, and see a period of essential flatlining in incomes per head for many, many millennia ahead of the Industrial Revolution, after which point we saw liftoff. The same pretty much was true of wealth. So during the course of the 20th century alone, we saw income per head rise fivefold, more than fivefold, which has no close historical precedent in human history. We saw wealth rise more than sevenfold during the course of the 20th century. There is no historical precedent that comes even close to that. We saw generational progress embedded as a social norm to the point where each generation was roughly speaking about 50 percent five zero percent better off than its predecessors we have not seen such generational progress at all in the period prior to the first industrial revolution so a period really uh, at least in income terms of real uh, and lasting uh, transformational. Next slide, please. Uh, another lens on that um, is we looked at levels of poverty at the global level. Back at the start of the 19th century, the vast majority of the global population uh, lived in conditions of poverty. Fast forward to today, and you find that single figure fractions of the world live in poverty, at least on the definition uh, I have used here. Still far too many, by the way, still far too many, but nonetheless, uh, a rapidly falling fraction of the global population. Indeed, if you look at the pink line, uh, a rapidly falling number of people living in conditions uh, of extreme poverty uh, as well. Next slide, please multitasking now. Um, if I turn from, from wealth uh, to health, you get a very similar picture. Miraculously, during the course of the 20th century, we saw average life expectancies globally double. Uh, prior to then, uh, people on average had lived that uh, Hobbesian life uh, short and brutish at around 40 years for many millennia, actually. And then during the course of the late 19th and early of 20th century, we saw that by the end of the 20th century, lifespans had roughly doubled uh, to more than 80 years. We can, there is no even close historical precedent to a transformation in lifespans. Uh, on that scale, the first great transition. And next slide, please. Uh, what was true <laughs> of health uh, and wealth uh, was no less true of measures of happiness. I've given some proxies for that here. One is a measure the World Bank produces of social development that exponentiated 
after the first industrial revolution having flatlined for many centuries prior to that. And if you look at something like the amount of time people spend uh, in leisure or the flip of that, their hours worked, that too has seen a halving over the course uh, of the last century uh, or so. And next slide, please. Um, and if you turned finally to measures of more broadly based political stability or indeed degrees of democracy at the global level, here's a measure uh, of warfare uh, between uh, the great uh, powers, although the 20th century was, of course, punctuated by two uh, traumatic and enormous world wars. In on the long sweep, it was nonetheless the most peaceful century we have perhaps uh, ever had. And measures of democracy would tell a similar story that the 20th century ushered in a much more democratic world than that ever previously uh, witnessed. Hence, Francis Fukuyama, only 20 years ago, signposting uh, the end uh, of history. We might come back to that uh, in just a few moments. So next slide, please. Um, in terms of some of the drivers of that great transformation, of course, there were many and various. But let me highlight just two uh, that are striking uh, for their vertiginous uh, ascent. Here is the uh, extent to which uh, public education was rolled out uh, on a universal basis in the UK, primary, secondary, uh, tertiary, a dramatic shift in what we economists would call the human capital, the skills and experience of the workforce. The globe went at the start of the 20th century from a situation where very few children were educated to a situation at the end of that century where almost every child was at least having some education, a true transformation in human capital and educational fortunes. And next slide, please, uh, Laura. Um, an important ingredient of that was, of course, the growing role of the state uh, in providing public goods in their many and various forms, not just education, of course, infrastructure, social safety nets, and the like. Roughly speaking, since the Industrial Revolution, uh, we have seen government spending uh, as a fraction of the economy, roughly doubling uh, century on century, reflecting that increasing rollout of those public goods in their many and various forms. That great transformation had the state playing a big role alongside a large and growing role for the private sector, the businesses, and alongside a strong and rising role for civil society. To be clear, the reason why we got this spontaneous takeoff in health, wealth and happiness and have maintained that for 250 years is due to the combined forces of public, private, and civil society sectors operating in partnership. My reading of the history books, just very clearly, the magic happens on the intersection and partnership between sectors, rather than one or other alone driving the economy and society forward. Next slide, please, uh, Laura. So summing up, a century, perhaps two, of true economic and social transformation at the expense of the environment, I should say, we might come back to that. One in which by the time the 20th century dawned, we'd moved to this, if you like, third, a third, a third model of how we live our lives. So roughly a third spent learning, a third spent earning, and a third uh, spent retired. We've seen nothing like that before in human history. Very different model. And to support that model, we developed 
what were at the time a set of new and transformational sets of social institution or social contract to support that third, a third, a third model of how we live our lives. That included, of course, uh, universal education, primary, secondary, and increasingly tertiary. By the end of the century, more than half of young people in the UK were going on to tertiary education, to university in its many and various forms. For those earning, we had the rollout of social insurance, the development of the public limited company, the establishment of employment rights in their many and various forms. And then towards the latter third of people li people's lives, pension systems, health systems, social care systems to support people uh, uh, in their lives towards that final third, each in their own way transformational to support this very different way uh, of living our lives. So next slide, please. Let's then, that's enough on the history, including ancient history. That was the first transition, uh, a truly transformational transition, not just in how much we earn, but in how long we live, and indeed how we live our lives, our 80 plus year lives. Now to the tricky bit, which is not the looking backwards, but the peering forwards into, of course, a pretty foggy future. But let's talk just a little bit about what some of the contours of that future might be, what form they might take. Because um, thus far, well, we are 22 years into this century, almost a quarter in. Let's be honest, so far it's been a disappointment, right? been a real disappointment. Um, uh, you know, if incomes rose more than fivefold in the previous century, my favorite century of the two so far, uh, current rates will be lucky to double during the course of uh, this. We've seen thus far a century of transformation but rather of stagnation along many of the dimensions uh, I've just discussed. So let me talk a little bit uh, to that for a second, starting with, uh, with money. So here's a picture. Let me spend a little bit of time just discussing it. So what it takes is, is people born at different times. So in the 50s, uh, that's the blue. In the 60s, that's a sort of green. In the 70s, uh, that's the yellow. And in the 80s, that's the purple. And it tracks their real income at different ages, the different cohorts. And you'll see, um, moving from the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, those lines transitioned anti-clockwise, which is to say we saw steady increases in people's real take-home pay for a given age. At a given age, the average person was earning much more as you scrolled through 50s, 60s, 70s, at your point uh, you were born, except for the 80s. So the 80s, we've seen that line rotate clockwise. And the average person now born in the 80s, through their life cycle, thus far, that line is falling below the yellow one. They're earning less than those born uh, in a previous, uh, in the previous decade. Um, if I extended that line on, I suggest those differences are not closing. If anything, they are probably opening up, not least because we've seen a flatlining in real pay in the UK since pretty much the time of the global financial crisis, 15 years uh, and counting. Next slide, please. All right. now, here's a different metric on the financials. This is similar sort of picture, looks at different cohorts bought, born at different times and looks instead at levels of home ownership of those different cohorts. Really read it for yourself. But the millennials here uh, are in purple. Uh, the baby boomers are shown in blue, plenty in the room I imagine. 
um, they did pretty well. Their rates of home ownership uh, were at very high levels. That's the blue line here. Just compare that with the purple line, the millennials. We are seeing a far, far lower instance of home ownership among young people, not just than was true of the baby boomers, but was actually true of those born in the pre-war period. That's how far owning a home has gone backwards for current sets of young people. Next slide, please. Laura, from wealth to health, because after a pretty much uninterrupted 200, 250 year sequence of ever rising life expectancy, we see evidence of stagnation there. Michael Marmot and two reports, 2012, and uh, 2022 has pointed to these this flattening in life expectancies. Indeed, in some places, a reversal in levels of healthy life expectancy shown here uh, for a selection of places on the right hand side chart, bucking that trend we've seen in place since the time of the first industrial revolution. Next slide, please. Laura, what's true uh, of wealth? What's true of health? Turns out to be true of happiness as well. This is a scatter plot of levels of income in different countries, plotted against measures of life satisfaction or happiness in those self-same countries. We see the flattening off. Money buy, might buy you all sorts of things, but happiness doesn't appear to be one of them at least beyond a certain uh, critical threshold. And next slide, please, Laura. Um, and when we turn to um, issues of democracy or indeed uh, of war, some of the pictures there are also worrying. Since this chart was finished back in 2018, become more worrying. Uh, this just looks at measures of extremism, um, in Europe, on both right and left, if I update this chart, it would tell uh, an even more pessimistic story. If I scrolled this across the whole world rather than Europe, it would probably tell a less encouraging story too. After centuries of secular improvement, we have seen signs latterly of that improvement uh, coming uh, to. Uh, an end. Now, could we go back just about four slides now, uh, just to test you here? A couple more. So that is the back cloth, a slightly discouraging back cloth of stagnation across many of the key metrics of societal success. But looking forward, what will be the other secular forces shaping our economy and shaping our society over the next 50, 100 years or so. Well, let me mention a couple. One is demography, because as best we can tell, not with some of those trends I showed you in healthy life expectancy, it's felt by many that um, people born today will most likely be living 100 year lives or close to 100 year lives and it'll probably mean they may well be working uh, for 80 years, 70 or 80 years of those lives. That'd be a material extension in people's uh, working lives and in their health uh, over that period. If you take that in combination with the second secular force, the secular force that is technology, it seems very likely on most estimates that over the next 10, 20, 30 years, we'll undergo societally a huge skills transition that many of us, perhaps as many as a half or three quarters of us, will have to reskill very materially to keep one step ahead uh, of the machine. 
you staple those two points together and you suddenly get a quite interesting picture. Uh, one in which during the course of people's 100 year lives and 70 or 80 year careers, we need to undergo not just multiple job switches, but possibly multiple uh, career switches uh, in many and various forms. We've never had to do that previously in human history. It is not straightforward to undergo skill shifts uh, of that scale uh, and of that frequency. Uh, and that will pose a whole new set of challenges, both for the world of education and for the world of work. So let me end with some speculations about those two aspects. Looking forward, what might this mean for the social contract, the social institutions that make up our education system and that make up uh, our working system as a way of making good uh, on these new endowments demographically and technologically and hopefully breaking free of the 22 years and counting we've seen so far mm -hmm. during this century of stagnation. Can you leap forward about five slides now, Milora? And let me start with, um, with education. Um, what can we say uh, with some degree of confidence about how this might look uh, in the latter part of the 21st century. Well, one thing I think you can say, already say, with a degree of confidence, is that the third, a third, a third model is completely lost. That will not stick during the course of the 21st century. It's already, I would say, evaporating before our eyes. I think most likely what we'll see increasingly is a commingling uh, of work and education on a lifelong 80 year, 70 or 80 year basis, rather than this trifurcation of our lives into an education block, a working block, and a retiring block. It's not just when I think you do education that will change, but also how you go about learning and being educated. The way I sometimes summarize this is that I can see a world in which uh, work uh, becomes uh, more like education uh, in the sense that um, we'll need education uh, to become genuinely lifelong. It's been a rhetoric for many, many decades, but that rhetoric uh, needs to become reality in the 21st century. Education will no longer need to be confined to the young. It will need to be genuinely lifelong in its orientation. And on the flip of that, I also think it's likely that the process of education itself will become more work-like. So rather than taking place uh, on an individual basis, uh, on an examination-focused basis, I can see increasingly that learning journey needing to be take place in a team-based environment rather than an individual environment. And that re the rewards for that uh, will be reaped on an experiential basis rather than uh, by dint of using examinations in their very, many and various forms. So the nature of learning I can see changing. And so too, what it is we actually learn. So one way of thinking about this, what are the skills needs of the 21st century is as a three layer cake. The first two layers of which are fairly well established, but the third are rather less so. so. The foundational layer of this cake are the core foundational skills we need, whatever we do in life, literacy, numeracy, increasingly, digital literacy as well. You then have, as the filling in this cake, a set of more specific, sometimes non-transferable skills that augment those foundational skills. 
some of which are academic, put in places like this, some of which are vocational in their many and various forms. We'll need in future, by the way, to rebalance the scales between those two things. But nonetheless, that will be the middle layer of the cake. And sitting above that are a set of, if you like, uh, transferable capabilities as distinct from non-transferable skills. I'm thinking things like creativity and innovation, resilience, empathy, leadership, management, green skills, regenerative skills. All of these are more generic capabilities that all of us, I think, would say will be important in the current and future world of work but which are at present largely invisible when it comes to our learner journey. I think looking forward to 21st century, we cannot afford to have those invisible capabilities remaining invisible. We need to find ways of making them visible, including some examples here, lifelong learner logs, digital badging, accreditation schemes of various types. We'll have to spend much longer learning about how we learn. For two centuries, we'd be constrained by the number of schools we have, the number of teachers we have. And that has meant it's practically impossible to tailor, to personalize, and to contextualize people's teaching experience. That has worked brilliantly for people who like exams, who like academic stuff, who like learning individually. But for probably for the two thirds of the population for whom that is not their preferred learning style, they have been disadvantaged. Looking forward, there's no reason why these people need to be disadvantaged. We can free up the constraints of schools and universities and teachers by drawing on technology to a much greater extent than previously, using the likes of AI to personalize and contextualize people's learning journey, to bring back into the net those currently being disadvantaged by a particular learning style being rolled out to the population at large. What we could say about that, I hope that's enough to give you a flavor of directions of travel. And just finishing up, how long have I got, Matt? Minus two minutes. Minus two Excellent. <laughs> Learn to finish at minus five minutes. Um, uh, in some ways, more speculatively still, let's just think about the new world of works. Extraordinary right now how little our companies invest in what they claim to be their greatest asset, namely their people. That's got to change. It's bizarre that we view investment through a purely physical lens in terms of machines and technologies. And that indeed we invest as businesses so little uh, in people. That must change. That social contract between employers and employees needs fundamentally to change if we are to have any hope of making good on that model uh, of lifelong learning, I mentioned, will be essential to the future world of uh, work. The way of putting this would be right now, much talk within business of the importance of ESG, environment, social, and governance. Of those, environment usually gets a decent pickup, government a bit less. The S, the social, is often silent for businesses. We will need, looking forward, the social to be much louder and much more center stage if we are to rewrite that social contract between employers and employees gives workers the lifelong skill and retraining they need to make a success of these 100 year lives and 80 year careers. The way of putting the point, loads of, everyone loves an entrepreneur right now and so do I. Uh, they are fantastic and this university is sporting lots of them, which is brilliant. But let's not forget the intrapreneur, the person that works in a company that's bringing with it that creativity and innovation and resilience, all that stuff I mentioned earlier on was so important to the future world of work. At least as much emphasis needs to be placed 
on programs for entrepreneurs as for entrepreneurs, if creativity is to be for everyone and every organization, not just the startups and the scale up. So looking forward, even the way we define work needs rethinking and perhaps redefining. It's only over the last two centuries that we have stapled together the notion of work and the notion of pay. For the much larger part of human history, work and pay were not stapled together. And looking forward, it strikes me as likely that that stapling together might be prized apart. Work that's done in the home, work that's done to care for relatives or communities, volunteering in its many various forms. That is all work too, albeit work that doesn't come with a salary check attached to it. In future, I think much more of work will be of that type. And that by itself calls for a redefinition of how we think about work. Indeed, a redefinition of how we reward work of that type. I've given two examples at the end of different ways in which we might reward those societal activities, which are work, but which saw, uh, which seek a broader purpose. My time is definitely now up, Matt, so I should definitely close. I hope that is, if nothing else, a bit of food for thought. It's a conversation that rightly with the RSA are leaning into. It's a conversation I'd love to lean into and partner with Bath and with you all. It matters to us all, whatever generation we are from, but no more of the young people in the audience in this university. Let me stop there and thank you all for listening. Thank you, Andrew. That was absolutely uh, fascinating and a huge amount of food for thought and for discussion uh, very shortly. But before we get to the question and answer, uh, allow me to introduce our, our second speaker today, uh, <laughs> Professor Rajni Naidu. Uh, Professor Rajni Naidu is the Vice President for Community and Inclusion at the University of Bath and the UNESCO Chair and Co-Director of the International Centre for Higher Education Management here in our School of Management at Bath. Rajni will respond uh, to some of the themes laid out, laid out by Andrew. Thank you, Rajni. Thank you very much. Um, so um, Andy Haldane has presented us with a profound vision for a future of regeneration. He has outlined very powerfully how this requires a rethinking of our social institutions and our cultural norms. I would like to add my thanks to Andy for this vision of change and especially for traveling to Bath to engage with us after the long and arid uh, spell of online interaction that we've had. I would also like to thank our lay member of council, John McClaverty, for developing this opportunity for us and also, I want to thank you, Don, for being such an important, critical friend to me in my role. So it's really impossible to do justice to the, to the depth, the scale and the complexity of the vision that Andy has presented in the five minutes um, allotted to me. So I will simply touch on a few elements and pose some questions about what this means for the future of the university. I really like the idea of the university as part of an ecosystem um, because it moves us away from thinking about the university merely as a physical space with boundaries. We all know that the challenges that are facing us today can only be solved by countries and institutions working across disciplinary boundaries and functional boundaries. So actually thinking of the university as a node of physical and virtual connections, as a meeting place that compresses and connects the local with the global, 
that links communities, businesses, and governments, that generates brokers and applies new knowledge is really, really very valuable to us. There are two questions that emerge for me. First, in, Andrew's, um, in Andy's ecosystem, there are unequal power geometries in the present and which will probably re-enter in some form in, in the future as well. Um, we know that different social groups will have highly unequal access um, to these flows and to these interconnections. So one of the questions for me is how do we as a university open up new nodes of connection and different types of engagement so that groups that are excluded may engage in the movement towards what I will call a just transition that um, Andy has, has invoked. The next question for us is how do we as universities survive into the future? We will face increasing competition from a booming list of global corporations with mega platforms, all of them promising education for career and salary advancement. So rather than following along their trajectory, we will need to strengthen the ways in which we differentiate ourselves from these alternative providers of education while at the same time developing all the different partnerships that, that Andy mentions. Um, second, Andy has outlined a really exciting future look at the relationship between um, education, work, and life. Um, he's spoken about changes in, in lifespan, the necessity for portfolio careers, and the rise of artificial intelligence. What's exciting for us as educators, as Andy has also spoken about, learning how to learn. And all of the research on advanced learning indicates that learning how to learn requires experimentation, it requires critical thinking, and it requires controlled exposure to uncertainty. So in a sense, we are returning to some of the key principles of a liberal education. But if I can look at our present context for the moment, there are significant pressures on teachers and schools to teach narrowly for the test. We have a, a, a narrowing of the curriculum. Um, we have rising forms of hyper-consumerism in universities. And as educators, we are constantly balancing these pressures so that we can maintain the space for creativity and innovation. And we are doing that really, really well at the University of Bath. But the challenge for us going forward is how do we implement the important principles that arose out of an elitist model of free and full-time higher education? How do we implement these in a very different era of mass education, of lifelong education, of a really different um, relationship with work and in the different forms of partnership that, that Andy has mentioned. Finally, the proposals that have been put forward require forms of democratic deliberation through which choices can be made and choices can be implemented. And of course, this is part of a much longer discussion. But one way in which universities can respond to what has been termed the democracy deficit is to actually renew our space as a university for dialogue. How do we do this? Firstly, we do this in our curriculum. At the University of Bath, we are incorporating climate change and global citizenship in our programs. 
Um, there are lots of other ways in which we can do that. Uh, Martha Nussbaum, the Harvard philosopher, has spoken about how we it can incorporate the foundational skills and the technical skills with empathy for the suffering of people that are both near and that are distant from us. And also, how can we face some of the dangers and the threats that is faced by democracy and how do how can we equip students to firstly identify the threats and work collectively towards that secondly we've spoken about populism and extremism and i think we as universities can apply academic rigor to throw light on the causes and the conditions which give rise to these calamities and these um, fractures that are really facing society. We can enhance digital um, literacy to counter the rise of algorithms in media feeds, which confirm racial and other biases, which manufacture fear, and which sow deep divisions between communities. I think also importantly as universities, we will really need to find a way to reach those who have been left behind, those who are cynical, those who are disillusioned. And we need to do that through popular rather than populist forms of engagement, thus creating an enlarged space for democratic deliberation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rajni. Uh, we now have about 15, uh, 20 minutes or so for questions. I want to invite Andy uh, to come back up. If you, I'll, I'll just perch here, if you want to stand centrally. And uh, we have two microphones. Don't know if this one, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll just kind of perch here. And um, if, if you stay in the centre, and have we got questions? We've got a hand up over here. So if we can get a microphone, thank you, Laura. And uh, yeah, so we're going to have online questions as well. Can I just uh, remind people who are here that ev this is being recorded, so your, your voice will be recorded. Uh, hopefully that's okay. And um, and do wait for the microphone to come to you. We're going to take a couple of questions here and then I will take some online questions as well. So, um, and perhaps you could just tell us, uh, yeah, it's not blind date. You don't have to tell us what's your name and where you come from, but um, you, you, if you just could tell us uh, perhaps yeah. if you're a staff here or a student or a local to Bath or, or, or something else. That'd be good. Sure. Um, hi, I'm Dan Davis. Um, I direct the DBA in higher education management here at the University of Bath. We just started a new cohort today of 24 students and they're all in the audience this evening. So uh, we are an example of, of lifelong learning. And I, I really appreciate what you said, Andy, about both the rhetoric and reality of lifelong learning. Um, I absolutely believe in it. And uh, I think that the, the DBA, which uh, draws on uh, people from around the world working in universities at many different stages in their careers, really exemplifies that. However, what we've observed in the last 10 years in particular is that the marketization of higher education has actually led our student cohorts on the whole to become younger. Um, we are getting much more than 18 to 21, 18 to 22 year old band. And we saw only last week um, that Birkbeck University of London, you know, the, the originator, if you like, of lifelong learning is running into severe problems financially because its model of lifelong learning does not fit with the finan financial realities of a marketized system. So I just wonder how we can make the rhetoric of lifelong learning a reality in, in the context of marketization. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, if we gather the second question uh, and then we'll take both those at the same time. Yeah. Hello, Mike, can you hear me? My name is Stephen Dawson. Uh, you're, and I'm a Bath resident. Uh, you're heavily involved in 
leveling up and social mobility, which happen to be passions of mine, particularly in the Southwest, which is not, doesn't get the same publicity as other parts of the country. Um, are you optimistic? We seem to be stuck. Those issues don't seem to be improving despite some attention from the government. Uh, are you optimistic? And do you see a change in that balance, that partnership you were talking about between government, business and the civil sector? Do you want to respond to those? Yes, I'll, then um, we'll, we'll that's take a great question. Thank By you. Way, huge thanks to Rajani as well. Fantastic set of comments. Um, um, so to, 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 to Dan's question, um, one fantastically here with the students. Um, on the financial challenges you, you mentioned, um, in a way, what you say doesn't surprise me, and it does alarm me. Uh, to hear it. I hadn't heard about the Birkbeck news, but that would be bad news, given that's the opposite of the direction of travel we plainly need to be heading. Um, I did think it was good news that the words, indeed the, the policies, lifetime learning guarantee, lifetime learning entitlement, had begun to be put in place. Truth be told, and this goes to your financial question, I think we are still at least one decimal point out when it comes to thinking about what's needed financially to make good uh, on that different model of learning. Indeed, even the fact that, you know, the lifetime learning entitlement is entitlement to debt, right? Entitlement to borrow, which is a strange concept of entitlement, uh, that one. Um, so I do think um, what we are seeing directionally is right. But as in so much of the broadly based skills agenda, the scale of the current set of initiatives is, is way off, given the scale of the challenge that we face. And I hope that's a debate, both about financials and about the initiatives we can, we can have uh, more energetically uh, looking ahead to speak the challenges that you, you raise. I don't have an instant answer to your question, but I think it's just the right question. And I think your diagnosis is uh, absolutely the right one in terms of scale initiative relative to the scale of challenge that we face, including financially. Then to Stephen's question about levelling up, and um, I've become late in life an optimist, um, uh, which is, I hope, a healthy thing. Uh, and that extends to levelling up uh, for what it's worth. Um, why do I say that? Well, there's no question that budgets are tight. I don't just mean governmentally, everyone's budget is tighter right now. Uh, but of course, one of the key sources of that, uh, those tight budgets is the cost of living crisis, which without any question or shadow of a doubt, will fall disproportionately uh, on the people and the places that were most disadvantaged in the first place. So if levelling up uh, was a social moral, economic, and political imperative in January. It must be even more of those things here in November. Uh, that makes me hope um, that uh, levelling up remains alive and kicking, indeed even more important now than it was when we first embarked down uh, this path when Boris Johnson first mentioned it back in the middle of 2019, which feels like a different epoch. Um, uh, I think for us to make good on that, there are lots of essential preconditions, which we could discuss, but let me mention one, without which I think we will make no progress on this looking ahead. And funny enough, the one I'm going to mention doesn't require lots of extra money. What it requires instead is an act of bravery. And that act of bravery, politically, would be to, to devolve many more powers uh, than is currently the case. And indeed, many more powers than were even mooted at the time of the levelling up white paper, in which I had something of a hand in a couple of feet uh, earlier in the year. We tried there to paint what was actually a pretty ambitious set of plans for broadly speaking Devo, which if made good on, would be the biggest um, 
decentralization of powers in the UK for at least a century. But I now think looking back, that wasn't remotely ambitious enough. It was still lead to a, a model of governance in the UK that was a significant international outlier in respect of powers to spend and more particularly powers to tax. And ultimately, if we are to broke into what are a set of deeply entrenched and often hyper-local problems around levelling up, that will not happen, that cannot happen without local information and local agency. And that calls for a genuine transformation uh, of powers from the central to the local level. I hope that can happen because for me, it is a sine qua non of making good on the social, economic, moral, and political imperative that is leveling up. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I'm gonna take a question from uh, online now. A number of questions have come in on the same topic and you, you hinted at it earlier, but I'll just read this one. It says, these great advances for the human population have been at the detriment of the natural world and other living species. Similar graphs which show environmental deterioration and decline since the Industrial Revolution. Given the ensuing planetary emergency, how do you see the next 50 years? And will it be possible to reverse this decline and rethink anthropocentric progress? Yeah. Very good. And I'm, I'm very conscious that I tried to um, grant myself um, uh, a free pass on all men's environment at the beginning, but I'm, I know it would come back. And it's right that it does come back. Because it's absolutely right. You, you, the flip side of the great, the first great transition I mentioned is we moved from a regime, an economic and social regime, that was broadly speaking sustainable in natural capital terms prior to the Re Industrial Revolution, to one that has been clearly extractive uh, of natural capital over the last 250 uh, years in a way that is plainly unsustainable. So we've gone sustainable pressure industrial revolution, broadly speaking, to deeply extractive for the last 250 years. What is the next chapter in this story? Well, it plainly can't be a continuation of the extractive regime, for reasons that everyone in this room knows about. Uh, and ultimately, that would lead to such significant economic and societal costs that we couldn't possibly continue. But I also want to argue that going back to the pre-industrial revolution, sustainable regime is also insufficiently ambitious. The next chapter needs not to be about sustainability, but about regeneration the replenishment of the natural capital that we've been consuming for the last 250 years. It turns out net zero isn't good enough. It's good enough to sustain, but it's not good enough to replenish. And that's why I mentioned en passant, but very importantly, the need to shift to regenerative practice in how we run our universities in how we run our businesses, in how we run our economy and society. That is the next frontier. Sustainability is best practice, but not good enough. Next practice is regeneration, and not just of natural capital, but of human capital, social capital, and physical capital too. Regeneration in the lingo of people, place, and planet, that's what the next chapter needs to look like. We need business models for divine that are themselves regenerative. That is a very exciting new frontier of practice. It was there, if you look back to Nick Stern's report on climate change way back, the bit of Nick's report that's always remembered, rightly, is the challenge part of it the climate challenge we all now face, that challenge is even greater than when Nick wrote his report. The other half of Nick's report is about the opportunity this presents for transformative technologies to give the giddy up 
to our economy and society at the same time as making good in our climate challenge. That's the bit we lean into now. And that means going way beyond sustainability into regeneration. Okay. Thank you. I think we've got time for another couple of uh, questions from the floor here. So um, there's a question there. And I, I can see lots of hands, so I'm going to have to, um, I think oh, this uh, lady in the green jumper there was pretty quick on the draw. Um, Put shorter answers in as well. That okay, help. all right, and then we green. might get a few more. Um, if we start with here, if you can say who you are. And... Yes, uh, I'm Lucia Burnick. I'm a student here at Bath as well. Um, not a simple question, sorry. Uh, with all this model of how employers and employees have to renegotiate the contract uh, and a contract in like very uh, philosophical terms, but also knowing that people come and go through different jobs in a very long journey of uh, labor. And with the situation of universities and how knowledge is produced, what is the future of innovation? How is innovation going to be funded? And how is, how is it going to work? I, I'm not ex expecting an answer, but I would love to see, to hear what ideas you have so far on this uh, conundrum. Great, okay, thank you. Thank you, and... Yep. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name's Jane White. I'm a professor of maths here in the university. Um, so my question, broadly speaking, is as you look forwards, how do you see the balance in education between public good and personal gain? And is there a balance that, so how do you see the current balance between those two? Are they trading off in some way? And where should we get to in order to have the best possible educational outcomes for the country? Thank you. Okay, maybe I'll take, I'll take one more. Um, down here at the front. Good evening, I'm Annette Hayton. I'm based in the education department here at Bath. Um, I was interested in your new model of education, uh, which I'd largely agree with. And as you said, has to happen in order to get these regenerative, regenerative processes underway. You did say at one point there was a little bit of deja vu involved though, because looking back to the late 90s and the 2000s, um, a lot of these issues were raised and were high on the agenda for education at that point. And I wondered if you'd be able to comment on why they have slipped away, um, which I personally try to be optimistic, but do find very depressing. Thank you. Um, do you want to tackle those, Andrew, and then maybe we'll have one more online and then... I'll have a go. I've got a nasty feeling that people asking the questions might know much more about the subject than I do. <laughs> um, not the first time that has happened. Um, the, the three great questions and, and massive issues. We'd have a whole seminar about each and every one of them. Um, let me be brief on all three of them and maybe we'll pick it up in the, in the drinks. Um, on the question um, around innovation um, and how it's to be nurtured and financed and all that good stuff. Here's the optimistic bit. Um, UK PLC does startup pretty well. Um, we do pretty well at the entrepreneurial end of the spectrum. And indeed, uh, millennials and, 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 and Gen Zs show a real entrepreneurial streak. And that's a huge virtue, fantastic endowment. The question is how best we nurture it. Because uh, for all the fact that we do well, UK does well at startup, but is poorly at scale up, right? Uh, and for all the fact that we are in some sense uh, a nation that nurtures entrepreneurs, that's only true of entrepreneurs from certain backgrounds. Uh, there is a generation, many generations of lost entrepreneurs. Um, academic work on this is sometimes called like a lost Einsteins uh, or indeed Curies to be gender neutral about this, which is it's far, far, far less likely if you are from a poorer background that you'll go on and become an entrepreneur and innovative. And why is that? You lack 
the seed corn financing to get started. But as importantly, uh, you lack the connections. You've never met anyone that's called an entrepreneur. There is no network you can draw upon to ask questions about how to become an entrepreneur. Um, some fantastic and fantastically important recent research uh, produced by Raj Chetty at uh, Harvard. Um, Raj's previous work looked closely at patterns of social mobility in the US and uh, the huge differences state by state, district by district in levels of social mobility. His most recent work just this year uh, in Nature asks the question, why is that the case? And drawing on Facebook data, uh, he concludes that it's as much or more about who you know than what you know. Social connectivity really, really matters for who gets on and as importantly, who doesn't get on. As well as being a fascinating analytical finding, that's a super rich finding in terms of what might be done. The access to finance is really important, but as or more important is access to people you can draw upon to ask them about how to get started. And at the RSA, I'm super excited we do something to rewire the social network in ways that could nurture that new cohort of entrepreneurs that could discover those lost Einsteins and Marie Curies among a cohort that otherwise seems very well disposed towards an entrepreneurial career. So within a long list, that's one thing we might do more of to nurture and finance that innovation. And that bridges, I think, to the second question, uh, which really is a whopper question about how we seek that, that, that appropriate balance between uh, public good uh, and personal gain. I've got no deep insights on that. Perhaps we might pick it up during the drinks. I'd love your perspective on how we strike that balance appropriately. One thing I would certainly say with a degree of confidence is if we only view learning through the lens of personal gain, we'll leave a lot of people behind. Just a piece of work, a survey work, um, looking at the learner experience of different cohorts of society. And what's absolutely clear is the reason why you would learn varies massively by individual. For some, what floats their boat will get them to do something is personal gain, which would be a job. I need the skills to have that job to earn that income. But for many more, the blockers are as much sociological as anything. It's about their personal identity and it's about their social connection. Are people like me doing courses like that? What has this given me by way of agency as well as income? And that's why I think those public good elements beyond the personal gain matter hugely when it comes to crafting educational pathways that work for everyone, not just the privileged few. And finally, to the last question, um, have we headed in the wrong direction? Um, again, I suspect you thought, I know you'll have thought much more about this than, than I could, but I do think um, uh, that learning about learning ethos is really important right now. Thinking about whether our current pathways and interventions accommodate a range of, in other words, learning styles going out of fashion, learning personas, if you like um, that is not to say that we shouldn't ensure that everyone emerges from school with a fit for purpose set of foundational skills that first layer that i mentioned um, but for me you know, as importantly is that everyone leaves school um, first and foremost with a love of learning or at least not being put off by learning. And I fear right now, many people do leave school and can't wait to get out the doors. So the last thing they leave with is, is, is a love of continuous learning. And there is no more damning indictment of our educational system than if people leave with that, with that sense. So is it time to kind of rethink um, 
distinct learning styles, distinct learning personas, distinct learning journeys. I think absolutely, because I didn't put it up today, but that stagnation that I mentioned is as true of educational standards in some cohorts as it is true of income and longevity. And that for me calls for a more personalized, contextualized experience. I was chatting to someone this week, um, and you'll be more familiar with me, and they were using gaming as a means of breaking in to learning among cohorts that otherwise would balk at the notion of sitting in a classroom or even doing an online course where the learning and education is effectively subliminal. And I said, Andy, there's no way the people I'm working with would in a million years read a textbook. But they absolutely would read the manual that accompanied this game. Uh, and that is a way of opening a door or a window for a different approach to learning than that has, which has been typical for the last 200 years. And I think that offers real hope and opportunity. Thank you, Annie. I do want to ask one more question, if I can, uh, which is coming from online, because we've had so many questions coming online, and we've only asked one so far, so just very, very quick answer on this. Um, it says, the analysis of the past and present seems very gendered. Uh, many women already have shorter working lives and substantial contributions in caring and children, partners, parents, so perhaps the future requires men of the future to be more like women. How can a male-dominated society be convinced of the need to change in this way? <laughs> Well, um, you know, I, I, I can't help thinking I might be the wrong person to answer this question. Um, as one of those entitled white, middle-aged, middle-class males. Um, but I absolutely think that, you know, that, that more flexible world of working is one that we all need to make a success in a, re a reality uh, of. One of the great, great virtues so the only reason we've had growth, by the way, in the UK over the last 15 years is it's been very largely because of, being, because of female participation in the workforce, right? Yeah. Without that, would have been stuffed, absolutely, <laughs> economist says. Uh, but it's true that if you decompose growth since the global financial crisis, none of it's come from us becoming more productive in the workforce. It's all come from more people in the workforce. And of those more people in the workforce, the lion's share have been women participating in the workforce. That has been the single cylinder of the growth engine over the last 15 years. It could not be more important. And there's a big lesson for there looking forward about what the future cylinders of growth need to be. So I think I'm violently agreeing with the questioner uh, in terms of what's needed there. Excellent, thank you. Um, we, have, we have gone over a little bit on our uh, questions and answers, but I might just ask you, Andrew, if you have any just final comments, remarks uh, to leave us with before we go to our drinks reception. Yes, um, I'm the only thing separating you and alcohol, um, <laughs> and indeed me and alcohol. <laughs> uh, so all I'd say is thanks everyone for coming along. It's been fantastic questions. I haven't done justice to them, but I hope to do better after some alcohol. <laughs> um, this is a speculative, but a different model of how we run our economies and societies that will not be centralized and government set, but will come from key anchor institutions working in partnership. Anchor institutions like the University of Bath and I hope anchor institutions uh, like the RSA, and I hope looking forward from now, in partnership, we can build that different and better model of the economy and society. Thanks everyone for coming along. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Andrew. Thank you, uh, Rajni. And uh, can I say thank you to everybody who is here, uh, everybody who's joined us online, thank you for all of the wonderful questions. There will be opportunity to continue the discussion and, and questions over uh, canapes and drinks now.
Uh, and uh, just to remind that the, a recording will be made available on the IPR website soon. And we do hope you will be able to join us again for future events uh, coming up very soon. Thank you.